Okay, welcome again to Ark Fellowship. As you can see, um, tonight we're live again from my office because we have a, a, a church function on tomorrow, so we're not uh, meeting in our usual place tonight. Uh, we're going to meet together tomorrow for a function, a, a special function for the amongst the family of God. So here I am in my office. <laughs> Nevertheless, tonight is, uh, for me, a rare occasion. Why is it a rare occasion? Because normally I do my absolute best to try and share from the scripture what I truly honestly believe God is pointing to week by week. And generally... I'm reasonably comfortable that we I have always been on track with that, that when you look back at how God has brought us along in our understanding, there is order and there is a rational path in all that, and that didn't come from me, let me assure you. But tonight is really different. <laughs> Because um, if you've read the study already, if you get it by email, if you or if you looked at it on Facebook already, and for those who only see it on Facebook, I know it's really hard to read. So if you want a, a Word document copy, if you want to be included in the email and you have email where you are, just message me what your email is and you're welcome to get it also as a Word document, which is way easier to read, I know. Anyway, back to the topic. So tonight is very different because the Lord really, really came upon me way back on Monday. And I was sitting with the Lord and I was considering everything that's happening in the world, everything that's happening in the churches, and especially everything that's happening in my own country. For those of you overseas, New Zealanders talk about New Zealand as being... God's own. That's its nickname, God's own. But it's anything but. If you're in the Philippines, you're so lucky. You're so lucky you live in a mostly Christian country. New Zealand is not a Christian country anymore. It used to be when I was a child. It isn't anymore. Not by any stretch of the imagination. And if you've been around me for a while, you'll be bored to tears from hearing every, this thing is wrong and that thing is wrong and all the things that are wrong that is going on in our churches and society. We have to understand those things. To un, we have to understand what the truth is. But it can get on your head, you know. It's not, very, it's not very encouraging sometimes, I know. But we must understand it. But on Monday... Things were dire, you know, heavy, real heavy. And I prayed to the Lord, like, Lord, you know, what is it that you're saying? And he said, Jeremiah 19. Well, I couldn't remember what Jeremiah 19 said, so I had to look it up. And when I looked it up, I'm like, oh, oh. It's a pretty heavy message, right? So I wasn't in a big hurry to share it without being sure. So I did what you're supposed to do. You know, you should take the counsel of many. The many need to be people that you can trust, of course. So I shared with a number of people whose discernment I trust and whose walk with the Lord I trust. And I said, you know, I think the Lord's saying Jeremiah 19, and it's really bothering me. And it's really got me quite almost, uh, not freaked out, but, you know, more than a bit concerned. Because it may surprise my enemies to know that I pray for them all the time. And I don't want revenge. I don't want payback. I don't, for the things that they've done to me and to other people, which are, you know, 
the, the things they've done in this country to the church and people that go to church, it's a wonder there's any real Christians left at all, honestly. It's a miracle of God. But I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to repent. I don't want them to perish. I want them to get saved. They don't understand that. They think you're, you know, when you criticize, they think that you're trying to do them harm in some weird way. They just don't get it. Nevertheless, it's been nearly 30 years since the Lord first told me to go and speak to them. And he told me very specifically from some very specific scriptures. That's another whole story. Those of you who know my testimony will know all about that. The rest of you just have to take it for granted, right? But after 30 odd years, you get to a point where you, in the back of your mind, you start to think that, oh, well, you know, I'll be dead and gone by the time God actually runs out of patience and does anything about it. Because God is very, very slow to get angry. He's quick to forgive, but he's very slow to get angry for our sake. And thank God for that, or else none of us would be here. But Jeremiah 19, as we're going to learn in a minute, is a bit scary because it's about God actually running out of patience actually saying enough already you know like that's it i've had enough consequences i'm going to act i'm going to do something and <laughs> the wicked are not going to like it the apostates are not going to like it why because it's not good from their point of view it's a nightmare so if you care about them as much as i do and I know if they live, well, they're never going to be listening to this anyway. They wouldn't listen to me if, it were, if their lives depended on it, which, you know, in one, some strange way, maybe it, they do. But they don't understand that when God sends someone to you to correct you from the scripture, not from their own opinion, from the scripture, you had better listen. But they won't. So, when I share this, I need you to understand something. I am not one of those kooky prophets that says the world's going to end on Friday at 2 o'clock or, you know, this sign or that sign. Usually that is nonsense. Almost always that is nonsense, right? But what I can say categorically is the Lord has repeated to me over and over all week this is the testimony I want you to give. When I've checked with other people, it's like, when they pray, it's like, uh-huh, you need to share this. Everybody that I've asked to check, to, you know, be a witness to me, do you think this is really what the Lord's saying? It's, it's all been, yes, yes, yes. So why it's a rare event for me is, you'll probably never hear me say this again, but this is what I'm going to say to you. Whatever you thought you were going to do tonight, forget it. You better sit down and you better listen and you better read and you better understand. And if the Lord convicts you that this is what he's saying, because I've done my best to make sure that it is what he's saying now, like current, then please share it especially to those who are in danger, real danger. Does it mean that what I'm going to share is going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. That's one thing God won't tell me. He won't tell me when. But there is a sense of urgency, and everyone I've asked to pray has had the same sense of urgency. So that's as close as I can be for you, is that, oh, think of last week, you know, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Remember how I said about God ordering what we're learning? What could be a more immediate lesson than right now? So the, this is the one rare occasion when I will say, I'm not even comfortable saying it, but I'm saying it. If you don't listen to this, if you think, oh yeah, whatever, 
well, it's on your own head. And if you care about those around you, listen up. Not to me. I don't care if you don't listen to me. Who am I? No one. It's the word of God we need to listen to. So I elected, I told God this, says, Lord, I, I'm not going one of those crazy prophet people, say, say, thus says the Lord, no. But what I will do is I will share to the best of my ability in his grace what Jeremiah 19 teaches. And then each one of us need to understand that he's saying that now to us or to those that will listen. It's not many people anymore, not in New Zealand. Well, you need to understand that it's our individual responsibility what we do with it. So this is going to be like a normal art fellowship study. We're going to look at what the word actually says. But tonight, you better be saying to yourselves, this is God speaking to me from his word and I better respond. I better not delay. I better do whatever the spirit of God convinced me to do on the basis of his word that it comes tonight, okay? So once again, you're not, I don't want anyone believing me, believe the word of God. I don't care if you follow me or not, that make any difference to me because I, I'm not the Messiah. I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to follow the word of God. Okay? Wherever you are, whether you're a, a fellowship member or not, whether you ever will be or won't be, that, you know, that's not what gets you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is being a real disciple of the real Messiah who is the word of God in person. So to help us, God gave me another scripture to start with. That's where we're going first. Now, if you understand Madrash, the, the, the Jewish way of understanding scripture, it's often helpful to have like a companion scripture that helps by contrast, highlight or make clearer the meaning of the other scripture so they work hand in hand so the scripture we're going to is first peter chapter 2 so if you've got your bibles first peter chapter 2 or if you've got the handout or off your email or whatever so we're going to go first and this is what the lord wants us to understand his people need to be found described by 1 peter 2 what it says here is an instruction for us if indeed we're really his disciples or you really want to be okay so let's go there now my glasses on so i can read i'll just read it first and then we're not going to go through blow by blow because we've already done a whole series on peter but so hopefully you will remember anyway but we're just going to pick out the important highlights from it there relate to Jeremiah 19. So let's just read this together. So starting in verse 1, but 1 Peter 2, therefore rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. That's an instruction. Get rid of those things. It's, this is just not academic learning. It's an instruction. Take that to heart. Check yourself out get rid of those things like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation crave the truth the spirit is the spirit of truth pure spiritual truth uh, sorry pure spiritual milk means the truth according to the spirit according to the word crave that make that your desire to know the truth no substitutes now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, meaning we all know that Jesus is Messiah and he is our desire, he's good. No one needs to tell us that. We're way past that stage. But this is an instruction to people who already believe. Crave to know the whole truth. Do not, this is one of those times in the world where you must not be satisfied with half truths. You must not be satisfied with mixtures. You know, things that are just the tradition of men. 
or the tradition of whatever denomination you go to. To survive, you need the gospel according to God, according to the word. You need to know the word, him. Okay, crave that. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There's no temple in Jerusalem, but there is a temple in the world. You hear churches today saying, oh, we're building God's house. No, you're not. Nonsense. The only one that builds God's house is God. Why? Because the stones are people. They're not bricks. They're not wood. They're not, you know, glass and steel buildings. They're not organizations. The, the stones of the temple, the temple is the place where God dwells on earth. That's its definition. Where does God dwell on earth? In his disciples. Each disciple is like the stone in the building, but it's living. It's a living stone. God's dwelling place is, in, is global because his disciples are everywhere, all over the face of the earth. Each one is like one building block. It's unique, made for a unique purpose. And all of them together, acting together, are the temple where he dwells on earth. To be a good, solid stone in the temple, you need to be made into a good, solid building block. Sanctification. It says here, we're being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. See what he's saying? He's doing that. Holy means set apart. That's what it means in case you've forgotten. Okay? Kodesh. To be set apart to God. Separated from the world. Not like the world. In the world, but not of it. Remember? But are you? Have a look in the mirror. Who's looking back? A Christian or just another worldly person who knows a bit about religion? If the answer is the second, fix it. Fix it fast. Now, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, obviously the stone is Jesus, all right? This stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. In the churches today, people only focus on one half of the character of Jesus mercy and love but they're silent on the rest of his character it's a problem peter is quoting the prophet isaiah and isaiah makes it clear that the same cornerstone or like foundation stones you know we talked about god is building a house and we're the living stones so to start the new temple God put down a, a, a first stone, like a foundation stone, on which everything else goes off, is built out from that first stone. Jesus is that first stone. The, the New Testament temple, he is the first and foundation stone of it. You and I are stones that are added later to build that house up. Okay? But this same stone, according to Peter, isn't just in that positive sense. He is a stumbling stone. It says elsewhere in the scripture of Messiah that in reference to him being the rock, that those who do not fall on the rock, the rock will fall on them. You get that? That's exactly what Peter's just said. To us, that stone is precious. To others, it's death. 
those who don't fall on it, you know, humble yourself, repent, seek his mercy. If you don't fall in repentance on Jesus, the Savior, the same Jesus will fall on you in judgment. This is what the church has either forgotten or is deliberately avoiding because it's a less popular message. But it's the gospel. The, the apostles never, ever pulled their punches. They never gave you half-truths. Jesus is as much the judge as he is the saviour. Remember one Messiah, two comings. The first time is, is, the, is the gentle shepherd. The second time is the warrior king. You don't want to be his enemy when he comes a second time. He's scary, right? He's God. We must understand that our Savior, who we love, is also the judge of all things, who carries out their judgment. We must never lose sight of that fact. He's the whole of himself. He's not just the half that's easier to, you know, easier to approach. He's himself, all of him. Now, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Really straightforward. Don't be surprised when sin wages war against your heart and your mind. It's your own sinful nature that wages war on you. But you must fight for holiness. So um, Christianity is not a passive process. All that Calvinist claptrap about, you know, it, what do they call it? Um, oh, it's gone right in my head, sorry now. Irresistible grace, sorry, from Tulip. For those of you who understand what Tulip is from Calvinist, we're not going to go there tonight. That's just to get us diverted. But this idea that Christianity happens to you, that's only initially grace is grace makes salvation possible but to but to enter the kingdom requires your participation including we have to wrestle with the sin in our lives we have to actually resist it we actually have to expend energy <laughs> you know effort to walk straight it's not easy God is not judging you whether you are perfect because he knows you won't be perfect. You're a human. All have sinned, all have fallen short. And even, even Christians, we're a work in progress. If you can find me a Christian that never sins, then I'll find you someone that died already. You know? It's not about being perfect. It's about having the goal every day to be seeking perfection to never be satisfied or complacent about sin in your life you know so we're not talking about turning into some obsessive person as if you're being trying to be justified by the law we're talking about someone who loves jesus and therefore doesn't want to be sinful so you you strive you make some effort to live a godly life on your own, of course, that would be impossible. But that's why the Holy Spirit's given to us. The Holy Spirit makes that possible to be a realistic goal. Still won't be perfect, but you'll be very, very different from the world. What God hates is churches full of people who take him for granted, who actually go on being completely worldly. and stick a Jesus sticker on it because they go to church, say, oh, well, I'm a Christian, so, I'm, you know, that, that's it. I'm good even though actually anyone, any one of their friends will tell them, you're exactly like us. I'm, I know lots of people like this. You know, they've been to church for decades, but they're absolutely worldly. It's as, if they, it's as if they've never been to church because they've been sucked into, you know, deceived into thinking that 
they just have to turn up, sing a few songs, whatever, that no, no actual striving on their part is required. That is a complete lie. Anyway, you must live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Understand the next bit, because this is very relevant to our futures. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, so as a secular authority, as supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. If you want to understand what that means, remember when Jesus was asked about the temple tax. And he says, whose children should pay taxes? And the answer was, well, you know, the children of men. I mean, since we're children of God, Jesus was saying, so we're not subject to those taxes, are we? So you think, oh, good. So I, we don't have to pay the temple tax because we're God's children. But then Jesus says, that's right. But we have to set an example of that we are lawful, that we are righteous, and therefore, for the sake of the witness and testimony, go and pay the temple tax for you and for me. And remember, he has to catch a fish, and there's the two, there's the two shekels in there. The temple tax was inside the fish, St. Peter's fish, you know. If you're in the Philippines, you know about that. It's just, that's what this scripture we just read means. We don't need to obey the authorities because they are the authority. We need to obey the law of the land and we need to be good citizens because it's part of our testimony the spirit of god is does not bring lawlessness and rebellion and the rest that is not the nature of jesus do you see jesus rebelling against the romans no do you see jesus rebelling against anybody no do you see him keeping the law yes do you see him being a model citizen? Yes. That is what we are to do. Up to the point that something requires you to betray God. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So if you have a terrible boss, you know, I better not use names, but a number of people I know have extraordinarily bad bosses and their jobs are pretty awful as a result but God says you're my witness in that situation so you don't have to pretend they're not bad but you have to you have to live to a higher standard because it's easy you know the world just says oh it's a bad boss so I don't have to be a good employee for a bad boss no he says you, you're not you're not your boss's employee you're mine you're my witness you're my disciple. So you need to order your life understanding that I'm your boss. I'm the one you want to please. So be good, be Christian, be upright. Whether anyone else is or not, and whether your boss or your, you know, some ruler, in this country we have the most appalling government so ungodly bordering on antichrist well antichrist really the things that think does that mean we should ignore the law no god's been specific about this we need to be model citizens provided that doing that does not require us to break god's law so up to the point it will require you to break God's law, set a better standard than the worldly people around you. That's what he's saying. Because you're a witness. Why should they believe you about Jesus if you're no different than them? You understand? God's been very clear about that. 
for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So we're just talking about live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. So you don't have to humble yourself to these people because they're in charge. They're not in charge. God is. But on account of Jesus, we need to humble ourselves to be good employees good citizens etc etc for the sake of testimony if it's god's will to have these people over us all the more we need to be christ-like in their presence i want you to think of the gospel what is the kind of world that jesus came into ruled by the romans and corrupt priests so corrupt government corrupt kings and corrupt priests exactly like new zealand now exactly it's exactly what we've got so message especially to the kiwis it never been more important that we order our lives to reflect him he showed us how to be in the middle of corrupt government corrupt priests and corrupt everything do you understand? In the world, but not of it. He is our role model. Remember, this first scripture is an instruction for us. What those who want to be saved ought to be doing before we get on to Jeremiah 19, which is the scary one. We'll be there in a minute. Show proper respect for everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Fear God, honor the emperor. What does that mean? It's what he says elsewhere. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, if you're driving, keep to the speed limit. You know, if there's a if there's a bylaw about don't litter, don't litter. Whatever the secular laws are, obey them. But things to do with God and salvation, obey God. Do you understand? Two different authorities. God establishes the authorities on earth, including the governments. This terrible government we have is a curse on the land, but God sent it. You know, the rebellion of this nation has earned it, the government that we have. I hate to say that, but it's reality. Anyway, let's carry on. Slaves, in other words, people who are stuck in a job with a boss they can't do anything about like a slave, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Notice that, also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because, turning over, they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and, and, and endure it? So if you're, you know, if you're punished because you deserve punishment, there's no, there's no credit for you in that. You're getting what you deserve. So if you're a lousy employee and your boss treats you badly, you're getting what you deserve. However, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Your boss might not appreciate it. Others might not appreciate it, but it matters to God. When you decide to be Christ-like in the midst of that as he was, as he modeled to us. The people around you may never respect you. The people that are treating you badly may never respect it. But understand, it's not their approval that you should even care about. You're doing it not because of them, because of Jesus. The one you want to be pleased with you when you do that, when you choose to do that, is God. It demonstrates that you're really his disciple. And as things get worse, the opportunity for being Christ-like in the middle of very un-Christ-like situations is only going to get more and more. More and more. So take this to heart. Study this. Understand what God is saying. Because we need, we're going to need this. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. You know that? 
when when you are suffering for being a Christian in an unchristian place, you were called for this. This is ordained. Nothing strange is happening. You are having a Christ-like experience. Jesus suffered with us. Sorry, he suffered for us in advance, and he suffers with us in the middle of it now. And he's in Christ in you. It's suffering as well. How they treat you is how they're treating the one who sent you. Okay? So when they treat you as they treated him, you're having a Christ-like experience. You're having empathy, echad, in Hebrew, with God. He set that example so that we should follow in his steps. This is what 1 Peter 2 says. Read it for yourself. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. You need to understand that God is not asking you to be a punching bag. Jesus didn't threaten Jesus didn't retaliate, but he did call sin, sin. He told the truth, and he called them to repentance, but he didn't look for revenge. Do you understand? Think of the Pharisees, the terrible things they were doing to him, and trying, you know, what did he do? He responded with the truth. They hated it, but he still said it. He called on them to repent. But did he send down lightning bolts and fry them? No, he could have. He's God. Did they just did he cause them to drop dead? No, not till AD 70 anyway, that's when he caused them to drop dead. See 40 years later. But he's setting an example for us. So don't think this means that you should be a humble little mouse. It means you should be the best employee you should have for there shouldn't be any reason for you to be properly accused of something you should be innocent as far as it's up to you and when there's abuse and when there's wrong you're the one that should be speaking the truth and calling people to repentance unashamed unashamed of jesus jesus when you remember that love delights in the truth and hates evil we're to love even our enemies we need to tell them the truth and don't accept evil just like jesus did we need to be in the world we don't have any choice about that but not of it we need to reflect him so when you read the gospel and you're looking at jesus in the midst of exactly the same environment that we're in you know corrupt priests corrupt government corrupt kings corrupt leaders everything's as wicked as and i don't know about other countries i, I live here so if you're in a different country you need to assess for yourself but i'll be astonished if it's any different really if you look clearly and this is what god is saying to us he himself bore our sins, his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. You know, the church says, oh, Christ died for you, full stop. That's not what it says. It says he died for us, he took our sin upon himself, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Remember, sanctification, we have to be actively part of it. We have to walk as he walked. It hurts. It's painful. It takes application. It takes stamina. You know, and in your own strength, you wouldn't get through a day. You give up and go back to the world. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in us that enables us to do that. But remember, he's doing it for our sake. And for theirs, because we're the witnesses. But for us, it's how we get sanctified. The more you do that, the more you change. The more you make the decision to be Christ-like in, in every situation, the less like the world you become, the more like him you become. 
you know, if you want to be a spirit-filled, close-to-God person, that's it. You know, it's really simple. And at the same time, it's a bit intimidating. But again, the Spirit of God enables us. It's not like God is asking you to do it in your own strength, not by any means. You know, salvation is by grace. It's only possible because of Him and through Him. None of us could do this on our own. None of us could do it based on it just ourselves. You know, that you wouldn't get through a morning, honestly. Okay. And then, by his wounds you have been healed. Healed of what? Healed of death. He died so that you don't have to. He bore our sin so that, he bore the consequence of our sin so that you don't have to. God's healed you of the most dangerous thing in your life, which is your sinful nature, or the consequences of sin. He's made what was otherwise a terminal disease, being human. He has given you the cure, the, the possibility of being a disciple. Okay, Can God heal physical diseases? Yeah, of course. And he does often, when it suits, when, it, when that's the right thing for him to do. But that's not principally what that scripture is about. He's healed us of what would otherwise kill us. Our sinful nature. He's made not dying possible. Anyway, we move on. For you like sheep, you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. That's a direct reference to Ezekiel 34. About the good shepherd in John 10 as well. In case you're wondering what that's about. Subject for a different day. So, Jesus, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He made no threats. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We just read that. And we've done it a few times in recent weeks, but I just want to draw your attention to the New Testament. Hebrews 10 verse 30 and Romans 12 verse 19 in both of those occasions it's reconfirmed that where God says vengeance is mine I will repay I will repay vengeance God loving God promises vengeance not yours his own leave justice to God because he doesn't make mistakes. Remember, he's impartial. When he judges, he never gets it wrong. If someone can be saved, if he can figure out a way of bringing them to repentance, he will. But if they just can't be, if they're so stubborn, so wicked, so hard-hearted that they are beyond it, judgment falls. And that is really I guess our bridge to Jeremiah 19 we have to understand that this wickedness in the world that some days you think oh God, Lord will it ever end does nothing ever happen to the wicked remember we did Psalm 73 the other day about that this is what God's saying you know he's patient for everyone's sake, preferring that they come to repentance. That's why he has us be his witnesses in the middle of it. You know, he wants them to think, why isn't this person retaliating? Why? What should you just say to them? Well, I'm not going to take vengeance on you. You're in enough trouble. And I say, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you're sinning against God. I don't have to do a thing. If you don't repent, you're history forever you know I'd rather you were saved that's your in to give the gospel vengeance isn't for us to take payback is not ours to give you know we tell them the truth like he did even to the Pharisees it's your opportunity to say listen you need to stop doing that whatever it is not just because I don't like it, but because it's sin. God's watching. 
you know, and if you go on like that, if you continue to live like that, in the end, he will avenge himself against you for how you're treating his people. For real. Absolutely for real. And don't think it's only at the judgment. If you look at human history, God does this on a reasonably regular basis. Consequences. In the end, consequences. When stubbornness and pride get to a point where God himself patient as he is, slow to anger as he is, reaches a point where he's like, that's it. Enough already. Okay? Which is where we get to Jeremiah 19. And if I understand what's happening, if God's, if I can comprehend it all, he's trying to say, Rather terrifyingly, that point might be really close, if not already here. Certainly it will happen in the end. Like I said, I can't tell you, God's given me no definite when, but it feels incredibly like it's very close. So I, like I said, we mustn't take it lightly. I think we can go to page three. Yes. So we're coming to Jeremiah 19, which is our real topic. But to understand, it, we needed the contrast. We needed to know, like, if you don't want to be facing God's anger in the days ahead, then you need to understand 1 Peter 2. You need to make that your textbook, your instruction manual, how to proceed learn from it take it to heart take it seriously but now we come to jeremiah 19 the scripture that god said i had to share had to share i even i guess i can confess at this point because I, I thought a couple of times along the way maybe i won't maybe i'll do a different topic oh no <laughs> no 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 god made it crystal clear to me no no it's Jeremiah 19, sunshine. So here we go. First, I'm going to read it out, and then I'll explain it to you, okay? Remember, you must understand it. You must take it to heart, and then in prayer and humility before God, whatever he instructs you to do according to his word, you need to do it. You need to get on with it. If you, and if you need to share this message to someone else, like I say, you don't need to even mention my name. I don't care if they never heard of me. But if others need to hear this message of the scripture itself, you share it. You know, make sure you do. Okay, turn with me to Jeremiah 19. This is what the Lord God says to Jeremiah. Go and buy a clay jar from a potter, a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben Hinnom near the entrance of the potsherd gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is the capital of the kingdom of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They have burned incense in it to gods they neither Oh, sorry, to gods that neither they nor their ancestors nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. And they have built the high places, a high places like, uh, like an altar where you would go to worship. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call this place Tophet, for the valley of 
uh, or the valley of Ben Hinnom, but rather the valley of slaughter. In this place, I will ruin the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. So in other words, their own plans, what they think they're going to do and how it's going to be. God says he's going to destroy those plans. He's just going to override them and bring utter disaster on the land, on the nation, on the city and on the people. When he's had enough. Sorry, I lost my place. I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who want to kill them. I will give their carcasses as food to the birds and the wild animals. I will devastate the city and make it an object of horror and scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of its wounds. This is his own city. Jerusalem is the city of God, the place of his dwelling. You know, the, the, the temple standing there, remember? In the time of Jeremiah, the first temple, not the one Jesus went into, the first temple. By the way, he fulfills this by sending the Babylonians who massacre everybody, send the rest into slavery and destroy the temple. It's exactly what God says will happen. He uses the Babylons, the Babylonians to do it. And if you haven't figured out by now, this also speaks of the end. This is exactly the process by which Babylon the Great is sent. Babylon the Great is the biblical name for the principality of Antichrist. So instead of the nation of Babylon, now it's the spiritual empire of Babylon the Great, headed by the Antichrist. So this is serious. This is no joke. No joke at all. Got to find my place again now. Sorry, apologies. In this place I will ruin the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who want to kill them. I will give their carcasses as food to the birds and the wild animals. I will devastate the city and make it an object of horror and scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of its wounds. Then something really frightening. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters. And they will eat one another's flesh because their enemies will press the siege so hard against them to destroy them. I will break, then break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. Cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. This is what I will do in this place and to those who live here, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Topheth, the houses of Jerusalem, and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place, Topheth, all the houses where they burned incense on the roofs to all the starry hosts and poured out drink offerings to other gods. And Jeremiah then returned from Topeth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and stood in the court of the Lord's temple, and said to all the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring on this city and all the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them, because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. Now you have to remember this is Jeremiah 19. So you've got 18 chapters worth, which in Jeremiah's life was decades and decades. Jeremiah prophesied through two or three kings, I think, a long time. So by the time God has him say this, he has been sent to warn them about their behavior and about their backsliding, about their worshipping of foreign gods, or more particularly, as we'll see in a minute, worshipping Yahweh, but by the practice of the how the pagans worship. Remember what Israel did? They still claimed to worship Yahweh, but they set up two golden bulls, one in the north and one in the south, and they worshipped in the style of the Assyrians. They adopted all the Assyrian pagan practices, 
the only thing they did is they stuck Yahweh's name on it. That made God angrier than if they hadn't worshipped at all. They put his name on something demonic. They called good evil and evil good. That's what Judah did. That's what the churches in New Zealand have been doing for decades. I'll come to that in a minute. Everything about what I've just read fits New Zealand perfectly. Not just New Zealand. Most of the churches around the globe, most of the nations around the globe. If God were to literally do this to New Zealand, if we were only talking about justice, let me assure you, he would be absolutely 100% perfectly just and right to do this we deserve it as a nation. We deserve disaster. Why? Because of the rebellion of his own house in this land. Because <laughs> this is an apostate country. The wickedness of the government, <laughs> they're just inspired by the lukewarmness of the church and the fact that the church has no fear of God anymore and teaches and preaches whatever it feels like, whatever suits, with no reference to the word of God for the most part. This nation deserves what Jeremiah was told to say. So it deeply concerns me that God should be pressing on me that I have to share this scripture. Because I'm deeply conscious that this nation doesn't have any excuse. God is right. You know? If we remove Jerusalem and put New Zealand in this here, you can't argue. He's right. He has every right to destroy this country. He has every right to completely send it into disaster. You think the COVID thing is a problem? It's nothing. It's nothing compared to what can follow. Nothing. And if this really is what he's saying, then it will follow. I guess that's the point. It could easily be too late. Because it will happen in the end. Remember when Antichrist comes, this happens globally. So it's not like we can escape it forever. Eventually, it's fulfilled again by the coming of Antichrist. At Babylon the Great, not just Babylon. But we're in New Zealand... The country has no excuse. God is right to be enraged at us, and especially the church. That's why we've been crying out for repentance for 30 odd years. Like Jeremiah, and like Jeremiah, apart from a handful of people, relatively speaking, it's not a handful, it's like, you know, thousands, but compared to who knows how many people in the churches here? It's next to no one listens. But if some complete crackpot gets up and offers them prosperity or rolling around on the floor laughing or whatever, they rush and they they can't wait to get in there. They fill the house to listen to liars. <laughs> Unbelievable. And yet I've witnessed it all. Has God really reached the point where he's had enough? I guess that's the question, isn't it? Anyway, to understand the scripture requires a little bit of Hebrew insight. Okay, so here we go. You have to understand that Jeremiah 19 falls as part of a trilogy. Jeremiah 18 at one end and Jeremiah 20 at the other end. So sitting between 18 and 20 is 19. There's a maths lesson for you. But the three chapters are very, very, very important because they are a progression. It shows you how it begins, what happens next, and how it ends. So most of you, if I say Jeremiah 18, you probably go, what's that about? But you will have all heard it, maybe without recognizing the reference. You've all heard of the potter's house. 
this is the chapter where God sends Jeremiah to the potter's house to observe the potter making a pot. And he says to Jeremiah, what do you see? And he sees that the potter stops because the pot he's making has gone wrong. You know, it's gone wobbly. If you've ever tried, if you, if you get a chance to try making a pot on a potter's wheel, it's much harder than it looks. And it's really, really easy for it to all suddenly wobble all over the place and fall to pieces. You know? And it's, it's, a, it's a wreck. It's never going to be a good pot, right? The potter doesn't throw it out. He just squashes the clay back down into a ball again. And he starts over and he makes a new pot out of the same clay that was on its way to being a useless pot. And God says, can I not do the same with you? That's why we talk about being new creations. Make sure you understand. God doesn't fix Christians. He gets rid of you and replaces you with a new creation. He doesn't fix the old you. He puts the old you to death with your cooperation. That's why you have to take up your own cross. It's like the old pot that can't, it's never going to be a good pot. So he squashes it. That's sanctification. <laughs> Get ready for God to squash you if you're a real Christian. He does it all the time for your own good. He doesn't attempt to fix what's wrong. He gets rid of the whole thing and starts again. He makes you a new creation. And in his hands, you turn out to be a useful pot. You know? Where treasure and clay jars, it says elsewhere, that's a reference to uh, the temple. Do I need to talk about that? Another day, otherwise it'll take too long. The treasure in the clay jars, the treasure's him where the clay jar, right? The whole thing about verse 18 is God saying, hey, I can take broken things and in my hands, I can make them into good things, new creations. But here's the thing, it's on the potter's wheel. So that pot has not been in the kiln yet. It's still soft. It's still clay, if you understand. It's so... It's, it might be in the shape of a pot, it's going to be a pot, but at the moment it's still just soft clay in the potter's hand, right? In verse, uh, sorry, in chapter 18. In chapter 20, if you read it for yourself after this, I recommend that you do read these three chapters, they're pretty short. Jeremiah announces what you heard at the end there, that he goes into the temple and he announces to the people that this is what the Lord says. Now I'm going to bring on you every disaster that I've said, by which he means every disaster that Jeremiah has announced in all the previous 18 chapters, which is a lot. And they never believed him. They go, oh, God will never do that. We're safe. We're his people. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly like the Pharisees did with Jesus. They didn't believe God would do anything to us. We're his people. That's the attitude of the churches now. They can't comprehend that God could get angry enough with them that he'd actually punish them. That he'd actually say enough is enough or they're wrong. In chapter 20, they actually physically beat Jeremiah to try and get him to stop saying these things. They treat him appallingly to the point that Jeremiah actually wants to give up. It says in there, he regrets that ever being born. Because remember, he's been at this for decades and decades. I can totally relate to that. But he wants to give up. He's just had enough. He doesn't understand it probably, but the fact that he wants to give up, he's just had enough, is just a reflection of his master. Because God's had enough. And out of Jeremiah's mouth comes a pronouncement that, Therefore, this is what the living God says. I'm sending a powerful nation from the north to overrun you. You'll become enslaved to it. That's Babylon. And he names it. He names Babylon as coming. 
in the same way as the book of Revelation names that Babylon the Great is coming in the end for exactly the same reason and exactly the same way and for exactly the same purpose. Okay? This, this isn't history. It is history, should I say. But it's not history like human history that it's past and so why do I need to know it? Everything God does with the Jewish people in the Old Testament is to teach us about what happens in the future. Heilsgeschichte, German word, means salvation history. How history teaches us about how salvation will work in the future. Okay? So those are the two ends. What we just read in the middle is where they transition, where God moves from being willing to f try and do something with that deformed clay where he gives up on it. Where he says, enough is enough. I'm not going to try and make that a new creation anymore. Now, I'm going to deal with it. Because it will not bend in my hands. It won't respond. It's beyond correcting. It just, even Jesus, remember? The Son of God in person, could he get through to the Pharisees? No. Oh, one or two, sure. But for the most part, no. For most of the people, no. Mm -hmm. So, that's the lesson. Even Jesus himself could not get through to everyone. Some people are just beyond saving. They're so stubborn, so proud, so arrogant that God himself in person can't get through to them. That's the Pharisees. That's much of the church today. Because believe me, God's been sending people to these leaders, especially, for decades. They've got no excuse. They have deliberately chosen to reject what he says. So now we're going to turn and look at the components of Jeremiah 19 to understand clearly what God wants you to know about the message so you could really grasp it. Because, of course, it's Old Testament. It's translated from Hebrew into English, which is always a problem. So please listen, and I'll do my best to explain it to you. So we're going to the first part now. He, he says, go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Go and buy a clay jar. If you're buying it from a potter, it means it's a finished pot. It's, it might not seem anything, but it's a, actually the heart of the whole message is right there. Because it contrasts the, the previous chapter. Remember the pot on the pot as well is a picture of a person. God says, if the potter can do that with a pot, can't I do that with you or with humans? So the pot represents humans. In chapter 18, it's still soft clay. But the, in chapter 19, the pot that Jeremiah is sent to get is a finished pot. So it's been fired. It's hard. You know, you can't bend it. You can't make it into a different shape. Here's the part, way to remember it. It's in its final form. What God is going to say in a minute will get clear, but I'm going to tell you now. So the pot still represents the people. But what God is saying by having Jeremiah get a finished pot that can't ever be a different shape, he's saying this represents these people who are never going to be different than they are now. They are beyond changing. Do you get that? It's really important to understand. This pot, because it's finished, that's what God is saying. This pot represents those people that nothing I do is going to change them. Nothing. I've sent you prophets. I've done this. I've done that. You know, but look at you. You will not change. You're beyond changing. That's what this pot represents. Critical to understand that. Notice he's told, and, and apologies, I'm back. If you want to know where we are, we're just starting 
um, backing up and, and going slowly through Jeremiah 19 from the beginning. So that was verse 1, okay, so where he's told to get that pot. Then he's told to take the elders and the priests, or representatives of the elders and the priests with him. Why? Well, just as Jesus and the apostles warned, the weight of responsibility is on the shepherds. You know, if you, Jesus said, make sure your eyes are good, because if your eyes are bad, the whole body will be filled with darkness. What does that mean? He's talking about the body of Christ. He's not talking about your own body. Who are the eyes of the body? That's the prophets and the teachers that allow the body to see. He's saying, if you've got bad teachers, bad prophets, then the body, your church, won't be filled with the light. It'll be filled with utter darkness, false teaching, false prophecy, antichrist spirits, which, alas, is the condition of so many churches in this country. It's really alarming. But you've heard me say all that a thousand times. I'll try not to say it anymore. But that's why they're there, because the principal responsibility for what's wrong in Jerusalem isn't principally the people's fault. They're not innocent. They agreed to follow, so they don't get off. But the weight of the judgment comes on those who have led the people astray and led them into these evil practices, led them into prosperity teaching, led them into purpose-driven New Apostolic Reformation, you know, social gospel. We go on and on and on. Alpha, the Toronto thing, you know, having you bow down to popes and bishops, all of it. This is all godless garbage, right? Pagan worship with a Jesus sticker. If I sound like I'm being too harsh, have another read of. Jeremiah 19 and understand how harsh God speaks of it. I guess that's why I'm trying to get you to understand it's not a joke. Not a joke. So he has to take the priests and the elders. Why? Because they have to be the principal witnesses to what's going to happen. It's primarily their fault. So when judgment falls, it falls heaviest on the false leadership. Heaviest. But it also falls on the people. He has to lead them, taking this jar and bringing these people. They leave through the potsherd gate, it says. That's what I'll say in your Bible, the potsherd gate. Now, that's the gate on the southern side of the city, the old city, when it was still standing. It's got another name. The potsherd gate is, oh, let's do potsherd first. Potsherd is an old English word that means a piece of broken pottery. So what do you do with a pot that's broken? You throw it out. The potsherd gate is where they took all the broken pottery. Remember, everything in those days didn't have aluminium pots or anything. Everything's pottery, right? So it's, it got broken often. If you drop it, it smashes, right? So a lot of the rubbish was broken pottery. So they had this gate where you took the rubbish out. The other name the other Hebrew name for the gate, translated into English, is the dung gate. You know, where you take all the all the uh, dung from the animals, you carry it out of the city. You also, it was the gate to the rubbish dump. So God tells them to take these elders and priests and this pot and to go out through the gate to the rubbish dump. And, in fact, to go to the rubbish dump, as we'll see in a second. Very important you understand what God has not chosen this gate by accident. He's sending a message. Now, he says that the message that he's going to give is so terrible that it'll make their ears tingle. It will, we probably today would probably say they'll probably faint from hot terror with this message. So I guess that's why 
you know you don't normally see me this wound up i suppose but i'm trying to impress upon you the urgency of understanding this the warning god gave there at that time and he may well be warning us right now it's supposed to be shocking it's supposed to be alarming if we take it lightly <laughs> it's on your own heads if you take it lightly but i hope you don't because i sure am not going to take it lightly and he tells them that the blood of the innocent is on them they're responsible for shedding innocent blood in this place that's what he tells them these leaders right that's the message for the leaders you're responsible for people being dead that's what false teaching does that's what false prophecy does that's what preaching is the word of god something that you've made up or your denominations made up or whatever but it's not the word of god leading people into error leading people to end up enslaved to demons in the end so that spirit in spiritual terms you've killed them their blood is on your hands that's why it's paul says you shouldn't rush to want to be a teacher because teachers will be judged more heavily than the rest you know can i resign now <laughs> can i leave no do you understand the leaders are there because it falls heaviest on them and god holds them responsible for what's going to happen to the people he wants them to understand it so out of the rubbish gate the dung gate they go the potsherd gate with these guys i'll tell you right now i'll jump the gun a bit but i'll tell you right now it's the it's to symbolize the fact that what god is saying is i'm going to throw out the rubbish i'm taking the rubbish to the dump now you understand i had enough i can't fix this pot this pot's going to the dump this pot's going to the rubbish you know from jeremiah 18 he's trying to make a better pot that's what he's saying right enough this one's going to the dump to the rubbish sorry filipinos dump is the rubbish i don't know what you call it in the philippines do you call it a rubbish dump we do the dump then what is this business of burning their children just to quickly remind you of verse 5 they've built the high places of baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to baal so on right is he being literal yes he is we have to understand what this means so to understand it you need a little history lesson so remember when he brings them through the wilderness for 40 years and then into the promised land following um joshua and then they have to subdue all the pagan nations who are in the land right especially the promised land when they get there it's the land of cana occupied by the canaanites the canaanites are extinct god required them to be completely wiped out he said they were so wicked so completely evil that he wouldn't allow the israelites to leave even one of them breathing he required his people to exterminate the canaanites completely from the land don't leave even one alive that's how evil they were in god's sight so the canaanites had a place of worship at the same site where jerusalem is and it's in oh sorry it's on a little hill called topheth in the valley called ben hinnom so before the israelites it's where the rubbish dumpers where jeremiah is taking the priest with this pot he takes them to the site of the old canaanite worship and what they did is they would sacrifice their own children to a demon called molech Molech, the demonic deity of the Canaanites. And their way of worshipping Molech was to take their own children and throw them in the fire and burn them alive. You know, can you imagine that? Throwing your own baby into the flames in order 
to satisf- you know, get yourself a blessing. So you're putting your life as a parent more important than your child. This is the complete opposite of God's order, of course. It's up completely the reverse, upside down. So they're putting their own lives first, and to get a blessing from this demonic thing, they throw their, their own children into the fire. Well, that was the Canaanites, right? And God said, exterminate them all. Don't leave any alive. That's why I'm giving you the, the land that they had. I'm giving it to you. But you mustn't leave any of them alive. You mustn't let their influence remain. That's the key. You mustn't let their influence remain, right? So wind the clock forward to Jeremiah's time, Judah had started doing the same thing. They were get, offering their own children, their own children, as living sacrifices to Baal, the god of the nations around them. They didn't learn a thing when God sent Israel into captivity to Assyria, remember, for doing that. Instead of learning, they started doing the same things as Israel, the ten tribes, only worse. And one of the things they did that God was just God snapped. His anger went off the scale and his patience snapped. They started sacrificing their own children the same way as the Canaanites had, in the same place. This hill called Tophet, the meaning of that word has been lost in time. But language experts think it's probably to do with the Hebrew word tof, which is the word for a drum, a big drum. Because in the days of Judah, when this was happening, they had this huge bronze statue in the image of Baal, this pagan god. And they would build a fire under it or inside it, so it became like a, a fiercely hot oven. And women would come up and they'd put their own babies, living babies, into the bronze statue where they'd be burned alive. Well, these babies would be screaming. Can you imagine it? Two, you know, I'm sorry for being shocking, but it's important you understand because God is appalled by it. We're supposed to be appalled by it. Can you imagine people doing that? Well, to stop people hearing the screaming, the rabbis say that on either side of the statue were enormous drums, top, that would be beaten really loud, loudly to drown out the sound of these, these children being burned alive. It's a, the sin, quite apart from murder, the real sin in God's eyes is they're still claiming to worship him. They're, they're claiming to worship Yahweh, but they're practicing their worship, throwing their babies into this thing, which is the pagan practice of the nations around them, inherited from the Canaanites. Happening in exactly the same place, in the, in the valley of Hinnom, on a little hill there called Tophet. Well, you probably say to me, oh yeah, but you know, we're not throwing our babies into the fire. What's going on? Are we not? I ask God about this. What's the diff- what's what is the issue, Lord? And there's two halves to it. Which one will I do first? I'll do the obvious one first. The real sin in Christ, in God, he is God the Father. The whole emphasis of his law is that each generation should almost sacrifice itself and should lay down and put everything aside for the sake of the next generation. The love of parents for their children should be paramount when it comes to human relationships, right? A parent should always sacrifice for the sake of its child. If you don't look after your children, you're not looking after your future. If you don't protect your children, you don't. Your family line doesn't have a future. You become extinct, right? And so it's not just God's way; it's also common sense. So, something calling itself God that tells you to kill your own children, that you'll be blessed 
if you kill this child. Your life will be better if you if you uh, just forsake the life of this child. Oh wait, where have we heard that before? That's the underlying. That is the underlying philosophy of the whole pro-abortion movement. That the woman's rights outweigh the rights of the child. That her right to an easy life or her right to not have to bring up this inconvenient child. She's got herself pregnant and it's inconvenient. I won't be able to go night clubbing or whatever, whatever reason. And they make lots of tearful excuses. But at the same time as childless couples who would desperately want to adopt a baby, they don't exist. <laughs> Sorry, they, they're there, but they pretend those people aren't there because the, these these women, they don't want to go through the pregnancy. They don't want to go through the pain of delivery. So even though that child, if, if you don't want to be its parent, that's one thing. But they could, there are plenty of people who would be the parent for that child that is waiting. But no, no, no. It's inconvenient. You know, it doesn't suit me to have this child, so kill it. And they tell themselves that it's not really a baby. You know, it's just a fetus. It's not really a baby. It's not really a human being. Who are they kidding? Well, they're not kidding God. Let me assure you. When a nation starts killing its own babies to gain a perceived blessing for itself, and then they call it good. Remember what the law says, do not call good evil and evil good. Sends God into a rage. And rightly so. But then it gets worse in New Zealand because in a few months in the election you'll be asked to vote about euthanasia, which is really just exactly the same as abortion, only with adults. Instead of baby getting rid of inconvenient babies, you're getting rid of inconvenient adults. You know, people who are terminally ill or whatever, and they again. They make all sorts of emotional arguments, but at the end of the day, overseas experience is that people who say that they want euthanasia on their own lives, that they want to die, time and time again, if you look into it, they've been pressured by their children or somebody, or even the doctor, who says, you know, I can't heal you. Maybe, maybe you'd be better off if we just gave you this injection, then just go to sleep and not wake up, you know? Why suffer? We could just put you to sleep now. And they'll make it sound all nice. But at the end of the day, from God's perspective, it's other people who your continued life and suffering that they have to watch is inconvenient and uncomfortable. And it's actually selfishness on their part that has them convince you that it'd be better if you just we'll just give you this injection and, you know, that's it. The pain will be over and you're, you know, you're, everything will be fine. And people who are very old or very sick or mentally ill or depressed or distressed, you know, in Holland, doctors now, they've had euthanasia in Holland for quite some time. There's a lot of doctors now coming out and saying, wow, this is a big mistake. But they, no one's listening. You know, they've got young people asking for euthanasia because they're depressed. So here in New Zealand, probably they'd commit suicide there. They asked the state to do it for them. Life's too hard, give me an injection. This is murder. This is wrapped up to sound like a blessing. To sound like a blessing. But it's not. It's just murder. Getting rid of people that are inconvenient to you so that you can have an easier time. Whether it's abortion or euthanasia, the sin is the same. God hates it intensely. In Jeremiah's day, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. It brought Babylon and the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the city and the whole nation, carried the, those that weren't killed, carried off into exile into Babylon for 70 years. God did it. He brought utter destruction and disaster, just as he said. He was not kidding. 
that's what broke the, the straw that broke the camel's back a step too far well in New Zealand it's happened whether the euthanasia thing is the last straw I think it's just really it's just extra God's already had enough so that's one aspect but for the Bibles those of you who are really interested in the scripture and that we have to understand there's another way in which he put children into the fire so we know from Leviticus 10 if you read Leviticus 10 God had established the, a single way that he would accept offerings of incense right as worship it had to be done in a particular way by a particular priest Aaron right Aaron's two oldest sons without checking with their father they decided that they were just on their own bet they would give an offering of incense themselves it wasn't the prescribed incense just their incense and they did it in a way that wasn't the way God prescribed and they expected it to be accepted right this is before the temple when they're still in the tent of meeting still traveling through the wilderness well God struck them down dead and he pronounced to Aaron don't weep for your children I forbid you to even miss them that sounds a bit harsh that's what he said he was making a point he says whoever approaches me needs to be wholly set apart you need to approach me on my terms these guys thought they could do it on their terms they thought they could worship me their way not my way you know that's an important thing remember what we said about what Judah was doing they were saying they were worshiping Yahweh but their actual religious practice was pagan well, that's what's happening in the churches now God called what their their offering on the fire he called it in Hebrew but I won't bore you with the Hebrew it translates to strange fire not not acceptable fire when they burnt the incense God called it strange fire right so today when you get priests who make offerings an offering or sacrifice to God praise and worship and you know the practice in the church so they're using his name but if their practice is pagan even occult like what's happening in Bethel Reading what happened in Toronto Brownsville if you have the misfortune to go on the Alpha course and end up on the Holy Spirit weekend, which is neither holy or, you know, anyway, don't start me. This is strange fire. Offer and, and the incense going up to God for that worship is unacceptable to Him. Use putting His name on something pagan, putting His name on something occult the prosperity the you know the Joseph princes of the world and those kinds of people or the the positive message humanist psychology babble like Hillsong you know there's nothing Christian about Hillsong it's just the human psycho babble pop like Oprah Winfrey you know reach your potential and all that sort of stuff that's not the gospel at all not at all it's no call for repentance no call for holiness none but they put a Jesus sticker on it this is strange fire so if you're a leader if you're the priest who's meant to be making the this acceptable offering to God a spiritual sacrifice because obviously you're not doing actual sacrifices anymore if you convince especially the young people to give themselves over to this spirit this doctrine this practice which is actually pagan with a Jesus sticker on it 
you are putting those kids, those that congregation, you are putting, especially the youth, you are putting them in that strange fire, and they will spiritually die. And why are you doing that? Well, look at them. They're all got mansions, helicopters and jets, shiny suits. It's for their own benefit. <laughs> they're, not, they're not ministers for your sake, they're ministers for their own sake. The congregation is a means to their prosperity. And they give a message that makes people flock there in the thousands. They don't realize the spirits they get killed, put into the fire. It's the same sin. I'm sorry if you didn't get that. It requires a little bit more of a mature understanding of the scripture than, you know, so if you, if you didn't get that part, back up and listen to it a couple of times, you'll get it. Either way, bottom line is that, yes, we are living in a time where people are doing the same sin as Judah. The same thing. And our youth are the main victims. The next generation. They haven't been given the gospel for the most part. Been given strange fire thrown in it for the benefit of the priests. Now, I'm just checking a scripture here. Where are we? Way back when Toronto came, God made me a promise. I don't usually talk about it, but I'm going to tell you now. He told me what was going to happen, and it happened exactly, right? The scripture is from Jeremiah 5, chapter 5. Right at the end it says this, A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies. That the priests rule by their own authority. Not God's authority, their own. Because what they preach isn't from God, it's just from themselves. But here's the big problem. And my people love it this way. That's where it all falls to pieces for God. Well, not only are the leaders corrupt, but the people prefer it. When the people love it that way, they don't care that they've been lied to. They don't care that the, that's not what the Bible says. They like the nightclub. They night, you know. They like the party. They like the the band and the lights and the feel goods and the positive message and the blah blah blah. It doesn't bother them that it's not the gospel. When it gets like that, then that whole place, that whole church has become like Judah, the Judah that Jeremiah's speaking to in here. And when you get the whole nation is full of churches like that, like New Zealand, so much so that now we have a government like that as well, where it's openly anti-Christian, openly defies God, you know, and has no fear of God at all. Why? Because of course the churches don't fear God. Why should they? That's reality. And the people love it that way. Then the whole place is like Judah was at this time. Do you understand? That's the reality of where I live. If you're in the Philippines, you're probably a bit luckier, but probably it'll get there like that in the end. You, you know, you're fortunate that most people have a much deeper respect for God than here. Here, if you're a Christian, a real Christian, you're in a real minority, a tiny minority, a remnant. Let's see what else God has to say about this. He says that he's going to give that place. Remember, he makes them go out to this hill where those sacrifices are going on to, in this rubbish dump area. That hill, Topeth, he says, I'm going to give it a new name. The valley, and so it won't be called Topeth anymore. Now it's going to be called the Valley of Slaughter, right? Now in Hebrew, the Valley of Slaughter 
is gay helaga right when the greeks took over and alexander the great when they conquered israel they gave they were trying to say hebrew names right so they adopted that name because after babylon that's how by that hebrew name the valley of slavic that's what that place became known as just as jeremiah said right the greeks found that hard to say so they changed the pronunciation a bit for greeks to say it easier and it's the word gehenna gehenna in greek meaning that exact place right where those child sacrifices took place where jeremiah was told to take the priests and give them this prophecy right at that place where he said i'm going to send disaster this place is doomed gehenna in your bible in the new testament everywhere in your new testament where it says the word hell or the lake of fire the greek is gehenna this place represents hell why it's the rubbish dump the jews burned their rubbish it is said that the fires never went out day or night that the fires were continual in there because people were continually bringing rubbish through the dung gate, adding it to the fire day and night, day upon day, year upon year. The fire and the smoke and the heat never ever stopped in that valley. It's an endless rubbish fire. Okay? That is what God points to and uses to say what hell, Gehenna, the fate of the wicked will be and this is where he first says it he, he takes these leaders out there to the rubbish dump and says this is what i'm going to do with you i'm going to take you out this rubbish gate i'm going to throw you out as rubbish that can't be fixed and he tells jeremiah to throw that pot to the ground and smash it and remember the critical difference from Jeremiah 18 where it's just clay you can make something new out of it this is a finished pot remember he's saying that's it how you are now is how you're ever going to be you're beyond fixing that's it I can't make anything out of you all I can do is throw you out because you're a useless thing you're unholy worldly rebellious stiff-necked and stubborn like this the prophets who prophesy lies and the people prefer it rubbish to the rubbish dump to the fires that don't go out it's a picture of Gehenna the rubbish dump Gehenna hell the lake of fire in Revelation and everywhere Matthew 5 22 if you're taking notes Matthew 5 22 James 3 verse 6 where you see talk about being thrown into the fire and that that's Gehenna right this is where God first speaks of it and he doesn't change his mind all the way to the book of Revelation this is what this points to then he says now just for the sake of completeness we're going to talk about eating your own babies it says here that you're going to that the siege that he's going to cause against the city a siege is where you're trapped inside and an enemy army has you completely surrounded they can't get in and you can't get out so you can't get any more food and that's what they'll do they won't lose soldiers trying to get in they just stop you getting out and stop any food or water getting in and let you just starve to death and they wait until your army is so emaciated for lack of food that you're a pushover so when they finally attack you can't defend yourself because you're basically if you haven't died of starvation you're on the you know you're about to die so god says here that he's going to cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and daughters and they will eat one another cannibalism well when the babylonians laid siege to jerusalem that really happened and it didn't happen just once and when uh, the Romans laid siege to the city in AD 70. 
the same thing happened again. The siege was so intense that the Roman historians recorded uh, a woman killing their own babies to eat because there was no food. They ate their own they ate their own children in desperation and further fulfilment of the scripture. So I don't know about you, but I rather hope that that doesn't happen again. That's one part of the scripture that I don't, definitely don't want to see. But do you get the idea? How intense the siege is, how utterly crushing and impossible to endure the assault of what God sends against these wicked, backslidden, apostate people that are supposed to be his people, but are not. To the point they'd eat their own babies. Well, I suppose for them, if they can throw them in the fire, what's the difference? But anyway, that really happened in history twice. Both times the temple's been destroyed both uh, twice, first temple and second temple, destroyed the same way on exactly the same day, by the way, the same calendar day in the year the ninth of the month of Av. Okay, it's a famous day in Jewish history because disasters always happen to them on that day. Why has it happened exactly like that? Because this is where God said, when I deal with you, that's how I'm going to deal with you. Let's turn over. We're almost done. So remember, the most terrifying aspect of this is the finality of it. Contrasting 18, where he's talking about, I can take this damaged, useless thing, and you put it in my hands as the master potter, and I can take that clay, the same clay that's turning out useless, put it in my hands, and I'll make it into something really good and worthwhile, a new creation. Now because they wouldn't listen instead of being made into a new creation now they're represented by this pot that jeremiah throws down in the rubbish dump it smashes it is beyond repair that's the point when god reaches this thing when he acts when he pours out consequences judgment on such peoples and such churches that are guilty of this and will not repent, will not listen to his word. Incidentally, if you're like me and for the last 30 odd years you've been like a Jeremiah, been sent by God over and over to the same people usually and they just will not listen. And if you feel depressed about what happens next, don't. Don't. It's not you, and it's not me they didn't listen to. Because we didn't bring our opinion. We didn't bring, you know, I'm great, listen to me. I wouldn't even say that now. God sent us with his word, with the scripture. And the scripture was absolutely true about them. And they would not repent. They would not listen to the word of God. The word of God is Jesus. People who won't listen to the word of God, who won't be corrected by the word of God, are not rejecting the messenger. They're rejecting the message. And the message, the word, is Jesus. When you reject the word, you're rejecting Jesus. What happens to these people now is not because they wouldn't listen to me. It's not because they wouldn't listen to you if you're one of those people that was sent. Because God sent lots and lots of people to try and correct them. And most, if my experience is anything to go by, got treated appallingly badly, the same way Jeremiah did. Not physically beaten up. Well, I suppose some people might have been. It wouldn't physically beat me up because, you know, well, if you beat me, you wouldn't beat, try and beat me up might end badly for you, you know. But emotionally, spiritually, just appalling abuse I've experienced, and I know so so many others. I know of people who are 
almost got clinical depression as a result of how they were treated when they just went along thinking surely surely they'll want to know that they're making a mistake surely they'll want to see from the scripture here just we just fix it we just do this and instead of gratitude they got torn to pieces you know i know people have never recovered from that they're still faithful but they carry the wounds they limp along that makes god as angry with those people as he was angry with jerusalem for how they treated Jeremiah, more importantly, how they treated his word through Jeremiah. So if you're one of those people, and I'm speaking from my own ears as well, do not take it personally. It's not you they didn't listen to, it's the word of God they didn't listen to. That's why God himself, remember what we said before? Jesus did not retaliate, he left justice to God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Why? It's really him they've offended. They didn't reject you. They rejected him in you. They rejected his word through you. It's his word they rejected. Jesus is the word. You reject the word, you're rejecting Jesus. And they would say, oh, no, no, we're Christian. We wouldn't reject Jesus. <laughs> yes, you did. Every single time God sent his word to you and you said, no way, no way, we're not listening to that. That's the reality. That's why God is so angry. And that's why we could see, we could very definitely, we could see something in our lifetime, even like, I don't know how soon. It could be tomorrow. It could be in a year. It could be in 10 years. I don't know. But we will see it. That God will once again fulfill this because he is himself he hasn't changed nor will he what drives him nuts in the past drives him nuts now and when there's a point where it's like he knows that that clay can never be made into anything worth having it's off to the rubbish dump with it the pot that's smashed indicating it's in its final form and that final form is useless to him it's not fit for heaven, so he just throws it to the ground, he ceases to try and do anything with it. That's terrifying. If that doesn't terrify you, there's something wrong with you. Absolutely. But notice, it's because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to his words. This is in verse 15. He says, I'm going to bring on the city and all the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against it because they were stiff-necked and wouldn't listen to my words. Stiff-necked, it's a whole separate thing. Stiff-necked comes from, it's about donkeys. <laughs> if you ever tried to move a donkey, when the donkey doesn't want to be moved or steered, they've got incredibly powerful necks. You can't, if, you, if a donkey doesn't want you to move its head, you can't. They're much stronger than us. So something that God describes as stiff-necked, it's a reference to the stubbornness of donkeys. So stiff-necked is to do with stubbornness. So a person who will not be turned, redirected. It's like a donkey that won't be steered, you know? Stiff-necked. So it's to do with intense stubbornness. Someone who's impossible, or a church, or a nation that's impossible to correct, even by God, where God makes his mind up. That's it. Incidentally, the donkey thing, when the donkey's born, you have to redeem it. You have to pay five silver shekels, I think it was, the price of redemption. And the law of Moses was, any donkey that was not redeemed had to have its neck broken. A stiff necked donkey that was not redeemed, that's irredeemable, the donkey did not get to live. And you had to kill it by breaking its neck, breaking the very thing that made it uncorrectable, its stiff neck. It's a picture of the church. Anyway, home straight now, you'll be pleased to hear. So this is. 
and I'm very serious about this, this is what I believe God is saying right now about the people that fit that description. And the churches that fit that description, and alas for New Zealand, that is a huge percentage of the church in New Zealand. And it certainly includes the government and includes most of the population, the nation. It's not looking good. What could it look like? Well, our God-hating government has put us in so much debt over this COVID thing that for one thing, even the economist in me can see that if nothing else, we're probably facing massive economic recession in the years ahead for beginning. But there's lots and lots of other things that God can do. And principally, having seen what happened with the Toronto thing, I guess what I dread most, I could almost deal with earthquakes and, you know, economic disaster and things. You can kind of adapt to those things. But if it's something like Toronto that's spiritual, demonic, and there's really nothing you can, you know, you can't do anything about it, you're either protected from it or, or not. Remember, whoever this falls on, it's fatal, permanent. Remember, the pot is permanently smashed and cannot be fixed. So whatever he does will be permanent death to these people. Spiritual death. No coming back. Permanent. Permanent destruction, spiritually at least. They may not necessarily die as in the biological sense, but they'll be dead to God. Permanently beyond fixing, rejected rubbish sheep, assigned to the rubbish sheep, assigned to Gehenna, assigned to the lake of fire. He won't try any more to save them. He'll hand them over to what wants to kill them. What wants to kill them? Antichrist. Beginning in God's house. Judgment always begins in the house of the living God. Scary stuff, but it's the word of God. We need to sit up and take notice. But there's good news. Remember how we started with 1 Peter 2? So if I'm not talking about you, and please God I'm not talking about you or me, but even if there's the, just the tiniest risk that that could be you, God's told us what to do. 1 Peter 2, make sure that's describing you. Make sure we are people, as James says, not just hearers of the, not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Remember, the word for faith in the original language, pastas, means doesn't just mean to believe. It means to act on the beliefs. Faith without works is dead. Belief without the actions that should follow is dead. That's what 1 Peter 2 is telling us. It's telling us exactly what to do. Get rid of those wicked things. Wrestle with sin in your life. Get rid of it. As far as it's up to you, there'll always be some. But never don't be complacent. Seek holiness, meaning set apart to God from the world. You should not be like the world around you. Which brings us to the other things he said. If you if you suffer for being good in a bad place, if you suffer for being Christian in an antichrist environment, that's good. Your master is pleased that you've chosen to be Christ-like in that situation as he did. Read the gospel again now that you know that and you'll understand what Jesus is doing. You know, when the Pharisees are attacking him and he doesn't answer, when he just remains silent and then when he does speak, he corrects that he gives them the truth and he calls them to repentance. He never raises a fist. He doesn't threaten, you know. That's what Peter's telling the people to do. That's what God's telling us to do. Because it says that the one he will send this on is every house, every household that bent the knee to those foreign gods to worship as Yahweh, or in our case, to worship as Jesus, that which was really demonic. 
to adopt pagan practices to burn strange fire. Remember, God killed Aaron's own sons for doing that. Doing wickedness in Jesus' name brings permanent destruction for those that will not be corrected. So that's not you and me, is it? Embrace God's correction. Hebrews 12, remember, God corrects those he treats as legitimate. Those he loves, he corrects. Those he treats as legitimate children, he corrects. Don't fight God's correction. Embrace it. Examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith, as Paul says. And if you find yourself wanting, fix it. Repentance. Remember what repentance really means? Turn back to his way. doesn't mean turn away from sin. It means turn back to the right way. If you turn back to the right way, just by default, you leave sin behind. Jesus said, the one that loves me is the one that keeps my commands, treats them heavily, sets out as their daily goal to walk in obedience to them. You won't be perfectly able, you know, you're not never going to be absolutely perfectly obedient. Only Jesus himself could do that. But to God, it's the one who sets out to do it as best as it's, they are able, as in his grace they're able to do. God's not stupid. He knows the difference between the heart that is setting out to obey him and a heart that's like these people. They don't care. And even when God sends his word, they more than don't care. They beat up the messenger. It's very, very important that we do that. So our, our last thing, if you, we're on the very last page now, page 7. Or if you're in your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verse starting in verse 4. I'm just going to read this our last scripture. And the purpose for reading this is some of you are going to say, Oh, but that's Old Testament. God's not like that anymore. <laughs> God doesn't change. Malachi 3, I, the Lord, do not change so that you don't perish. He doesn't change. God, Jesus is God of the Old Testament. He's exactly like the Father, unchanging. He is loving, kind, and merciful, but he is also the stone out of, over which the wicked stumble to their destruction. If you don't fall on him, he falls on you. Remember? Scripture. Let's read Luke, Luke 12, verse, starting in verse 4. To understand because this is New Testament so this is for those people who are unwisely thinking I don't need to worry about that that's Old Testament it's not it's New Testament I tell you my friends do not be and this is Jesus speaking do not be afraid of those who kill the body after which they can do no more but I will show you whom you should fear fear him who after your body has been killed, has, a has authority to throw you into hell. In the original language, to throw you into Gehenna, the name God gave to the place where he had Jeremiah make this pronouncement, the place where they sacrificed their children to foreign gods, where they burned strange fire, where they did all the things that the churches are doing at least in this country, all over again. Jesus is telling them, yes, I tell you, fear him. Then he balances it by saying, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. So he says, fear God, but don't be afraid. It's not a contradiction, I'll explain in a second. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. When you disown the Word, you're disowning Jesus. When you're ashamed of the Scripture, you're ashamed of Jesus. What does Jesus say? If you're ashamed of me, if you're ashamed of the word of God, 
as the churches had that's what they've been doing here like um anything that's unpopular might make them unpopular with the world you know like on issues of sexuality for instance the gospel's the gospel position is of course extremely politically incorrect and they people hate you for daring to not go along with the godless sinful version that the that the population and even the government has adopted right so the new zealand law makes it virtually well soon if the hate speech laws come in it will be considered hate speech to actually stand up for the gospel position on sexuality right if you speak up for god's position on abortion they hate you well lots of churches don't like being hated they want to be loved by everyone especially by the world especially the ones god had me to go and speak to that particular denomination lives for popularity with the world lives for popularity with the government they are, they are history remember recently god said to me let the, leave the dead to bury their own dead you come and follow me i found that scary not as scary as this when you reject the word of god when you are ashamed of it in public where to maintain popularity with the world you agree to put the word of god aside to agree with them you have done what jesus said here if you are ashamed of me before man i will disown you if you disown me in public i will disown you what does that mean you won't belong to me that's what disown means you will cease to belong to me in the end jeremiah 19 will come for you he'll try and correct he'll send people to bring you to repentance he'll do all those things for decade upon decade upon decade but when they keep on doing it and the people love it that way remember from jeremiah 5 there is a point where jesus the word is as good as the word he says that's it nothing can fix you you've completely abandoned me you use my name are you even telling the world that i approve of these things when you know that i don't but you're just too frightened of losing popularity with the world so you abandon me to maintain popularity with your pagan friends and therefore i disown you jeremiah 19 time it is terrifying but it is reality that's exactly what's happened whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of god and everyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but whoever blasphemes against the holy spirit will not be forgiven we won't go into that just now we talked about that the other day but for those who remain in covenant with him in other words who remain in relationship with god on god's terms who are really his disciples because they don't just believe in him they believe him so they make it their effort every day to be christ-like to be those who follow him according to his word who set out as their daily goal to be transformed by the spirit and by the word because they want to go to heaven their goal is jesus their goal is to be like him their goal is to reflect him in the world as honestly and as truly as they are able whether you're just a baby christian or not to the best of your ability wherever you are in your walk so it's not about perfection remember it's about intent the intent of your heart god that's what god's looking at are you really striving to be my disciple according to my word so it's not just about zeal you know enthusiasm you can be a you can be a crazy bethel person practicing occult basically and you can be really zealous for that it does not make you on fire for jesus it makes you on fire for the demon that's at work there it makes you in the fire in the strange fire so it's not about zeal 
It's not about enthusiasm. It's about faithfulness. That means you need to know what the Word of God says. You need to spend time in the Word and you need to talk about it amongst each other. And when you have questions you can't answer, you need to seek the counsel of people that, that do know. You need to check everything against the Word. And it, it takes a lifetime. So don't be in a crash hot hurry. It, does, it doesn't just take a weekend. It takes your life. That's why God gives you that long life because it takes time for the bride to make herself ready to go to the wedding, for the broken, the useless bit of clay to be made into a perfect pot to contain the treasure which is the Spirit of God in us. If you're in the covenant on his terms, then that is the equivalent, if we go back to our Passover teaching, that is the same as what God commanded on the night of the first Passover. Go into the house, put the blood of the lamb on the door. Those, and you must not leave the house. You must stay in the house that the blood of the lamb is on. Where is the blood of Jesus? It's on God's house. Where is God's house? It's the covenant. If you're in the covenant on his terms, you are in him. You are in the house that the blood of the lamb is on. The destroyer. The, what God sends to fulfill this, Jeremiah 19, will pass over that house. The blood of the Lamb is a sign to the destroyer that it may not enter that house. It may not touch those who are in it. It will pass over them. That's why we call it salvation. I'm convinced, beyond convinced, that Jeremiah 19 will be fulfilled again, specific to at least New Zealand. Eventually it's global because it points to the coming of Antichrist. But it doesn't have to happen at the same time all over the world. It will be global in the end. But New Zealand, wake up. It might already be too late, but on the hope that it's not quite too late, wake up get rid of all that rubbish return to the word return to being faithful to the word and stop making compromise with the world for your history it's as simple as that and if you are faithful don't be afraid oh sorry i said i'd explain that didn't i fear fear god means take him seriously he's not kidding but then it says, don't be afraid. What does that mean? He's speaking to disciples. Fear God. Don't play chicken with him. But if you're really a disciple, you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because this will pass over you. This is to punish the wicked. This is to punish the apostate. This is throwing out the rubbish. God does not throw out what is his own. This is throwing out the rubbish. And God is the only one who gets to decide what gets thrown out and what gets kept. But his measure of judging is what he can still make into something useful, he will keep and he will make it useful. But if it's gone so hard that it can never be more than it is now, if it's still a useless worldly thing, then he's going to smash it throw it. Churches, nations, people, organizations. He sent Babylon to do it the first time. He sent the Roman army to do it the second time. What will he send the third time? The ultimate answer is Antichrist himself. Is that what we'll see? In the end it will be. Or foreshadowing it, we might see something like Toronto, another really evil spirit coming into the churches, coming into the government, coming into the nation. Or whatever it is, there'll only be one defense, and that's if you are a real disciple, really under the blood, really in Christ. So we're going to end there, one minute to eight. 
heavy message. Certainly, it's been bothering me all week. But everyone I've asked to pray about it, without exception, has been convicted by God that it's urgent that we listen. So I've done everything I can to make sure that you're not hearing my opinion or something I just dreamed up. We'll end there. What you do with it now, that's between you and God. But you know what I've said on his behalf. Please, please, please don't be going to the rubbish dump. Take it seriously. Take it seriously for your neighbour, for your family, for your friends. Understand First Peter 2, that's instructions. For now, actual instructions. Learn that, do that. Be found doing that. Next time, we'll return to probably more about the kingdom, unless God has other plans. I'm going to end with one thing I don't usually share with people. I'm not sure if I've ever told anyone this before. So it might, if I have, I can't remember telling it. But anyway, here we go. Remember I told you that God took me to Jeremiah 5, actually to a whole lot of confirming scriptures. He told me the same thing through a whole lot of scriptures he pointed to me. They all basically said the same thing, all right? Then Toronto came and everything that God had said happened. Exactly. Terrible and as horrifying as it was, what he said would happen, happened. That's why this disturbs me so much, right? But then he said something to me. He said, I will keep a remnant for myself. And with them, I will rebuild my house. Remember what Peter says? The house is made, built by the hands of God. The stones are not made of rock. They're made of they are living stones. The stones of the disciples. So God's been reminding me of that. This is absolutely blood-chilling, terrifying if you're apostate. But he was reassuring me. He reminded me of that promise. That he knows, he knows who's are really his, who really cares, who really love him, who really want to be inheritors of the kingdom with Christ. You know, at any cost. They wanted enough, you know, to to pay the price that sanctification demands, that discipleship demands. With them, those living stones, he will make his own house for the last days. The house that he'll dwell in, where his spirit will reside on earth, even while all this bad, scary stuff is happening. So I want you to understand, this is only terrifying if you're a fake. If you're playing lip service with God, if you're playing chicken with God, don't play chicken with God. <laughs> it doesn't ever end well. Okay? So I just want to encourage you with that. For me, it's not unexpected. I've expected this for 30 years. I was just a bit surprised that it suddenly happened. But there's that promise. Let's be part of that. We probably can't do a whole lot, if anything, for those who are going to perish, who are beyond saving, who are for the rubbish dump. But we can do a whole lot about making sure we are part of that remnant that he himself will set back on the foundations and build up for himself a dwelling place for his name, even for the last days. That's exciting. That's worth all the tears, that's worth all the injuries, and that's worth all the struggles. That's worth it. He gave his life. None of us have died for the truth yet, have we? He did. And rose again. If we don't turn back, we will rise with him as well. 
can share in his inheritance in the kingdom to come. That has to be worth it. So that's the end. That's probably a bad choice of words, isn't it? That's the conclusion of our sharing tonight. Red alert. God brings consequences in the end. Slow to anger. But he gets there in the end. So Father, we thank you for your word, as terrifying as it is. But we thank you, Lord, that you are God of justice and that you know how oppressed your children are by all this apostasy, how much they weep because of what has taken place in your house and what is taking place in the government and the nation. And you, Lord, will not sit by and see them perish. And you will not permit them to lose heart and die and fall away on account of such wickedness. But you have a limit, Lord. So whether it is tomorrow or after a time, we know, Lord, it's your word. You never send your word except to fulfill it. You do not permit it to return to you empty-handed. It must accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. So, Lord, all we ask is that you would give us your Holy Spirit, that you would have your word and your spirit work in unison and in agreement in us and through us and concerning us in order that we could indeed be living stones, not dead rocks. That you, in your hands, Lord, that you'd place us firmly on the foundation of your word and build us up to be a dwelling place for your name, even in the days of head, and to make us, Lord, able to testify for you and, and to snatch some from the fire. And for those, Lord, who are on the on the grey zone, whether almost beyond saving, but if you just smash them enough, Lord, to break that stiff neck and to to do whatever, Lord, you need to do, no matter how terrifying, no matter how uncomfortable, it's surely better, Lord, to enter heaven naked with nothing than to be shut out, hurled on the rubbish dump altogether with no way back. So for the Gomers, Lord, those whom Gomer and the book of Hosea represent, we pray that you who will save the remnant of Jacob would spare nothing to break them, to bring them, Lord, to genuine repentance, that whether it's to bring them back or bring them for the first time, just bring them, Lord, even if it's horrible to watch. It's better, Lord, we pray for them that 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 would be their fate rather than to be thrown out once and for all. So lead us and shepherd us, Lord, since you are our Redeemer and our Shepherd. We ask in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Okay. That was exhausting. <laughs> Probably more exhausting for you than me, but it's exhausting. Good night. God bless. Remember, even one sparrow falling to the ground, God does not miss it, and you are worth more than many sparrows. Take heart. Accept this correction. Follow his word. Don't be ashamed of what God has said. He is life, eternal life. The rubbish dump is that way. Don't go there. Shalom. Till next time. <laughs>